Previously on X-Men. Well, according to the Fresh Prince of Noldor, it is in fact a key. For what? I have no idea, but knowing these morons, it will probably be something like turning on Mount Doom like a car. One week later. Let's get into this. So a quick note before jumping into this, the Numenorians who are on their way to Middle-earth do so little, I'll only recap them after they've arrived and discuss a little bit on as they do so little prior to join the battle, it isn't even worth mentioning. And before we jump into this mess, please, subscribe to join my kingdom so you don't miss a new video. So, the Battle of Ostiriath is here, as Adar leads his forces up the pathway to the Watchtower with so many torches it looks like the so-called Serpent from the 13th Warrior, because now there are literal hundreds of orcs. Once inside, the orcs and humans who pledged fealty began looking around the apparently abandoned fortress only to be attacked by Erendir, drawing them further in. Just before he is overrun, Aaron Fuck Boulder's deer leaps from the balcony about a hundred feet down to the bridge and roundhouses a block of stone I don't think Eddie Hall could have picked up. Doing this pulls a rope and closes the gates. Then he fires a single arrow, cutting a single rope that held up the entire tower and that collapses down like jet fuel melting steel beams and crushes most of Adar's followers. This also brings up how poorly constructed anything the elves or humans have made, if that's the case. Anyway, as the tower falls, we catch up with Bronwyn and the rest of the townsfolk who have managed to sneak away past the army of orcs because apparently they were wearing horse blinders. They see the tower fall and begin preparations for the next attack. That morning, Erendir is hammering away on the hilt of the Morgul Blade, attempting to destroy it, but he can't, even saying, it's beyond my ability. I yeah, thanks, Captain Obvious. So he decides to hide it, wrapped in a sack somewhere in town, also saying, no one must know of it. Which I followed up with, please, Erendir, just don't do this, you're supposed to be smarterer than the rest. Anyway, Theo hides the sword, and everyone prepares for the next assault, with Erendir convincing the townsfolk the village is more defensible than the fortress. Erendir, you've got one more strike, my guy. After that, I'm revoking your elf card. The defenses are set, the night has come, and just over the horizon, the orcs once again let everyone know where they are, as they walk almost single file into the village, and Bronwyn is supposed to ignite a carriage and crash it into them, like Arnold throwing trucks at guerrilla insurgents. She can't light it, however, and an orc inspects the area. Then Bronwyn channels her inner Valkyrie, screaming like a banshee stubbed her toe, just to attack the orc. This literally does not draw the attention of any of the orcs not 20 feet away from her, and this orc kills the first of many extras who just stand there to die, then Bronwyn kills him in response. She ignites the carriage and crashes it into the orcs, blocking off their escape. This signals the rest of the traps to be activated, and the townsfolk, led by the Fresh Prince of Noldor, strike. Then the orcs that captured the rest of the elves from the tower earlier in the season with as little effort as flipping a light switch are now getting their cheeks clapped like a Sasha Gray interview, and an orc sneaks up and attacks Don Lemonless, bringing him down off the tavern. He kills the orcs in response before getting attacked by another orc that looked like he fucked Big Show. And this fight has some bad choreography, with everyone taking a distinct two to three seconds of standing there before committing to whatever the action director has to say. Erendir even stabs this orc in the eye and through the brain like the giant from 300, and he's totally fine even though he's losing so much blood you could chum for sharks with him. Then Bronwyn saves the Fresh Prince of Noldor, killing this orc from behind, while at the same time, conveniently, the rest of the orcs were defeated off screen as well. Yeah, sure. The few townsfolk remaining gather around and discover that many of the orcs are the deserters and the rest of the orcs were led by Adar around the back and they counterattack by killing many in the process and even severely injuring Bronwyn. Then Erendir says to pull back into the keep, and yes, he actually says that before someone immediately corrects him and says, no, into the tavern. Once inside, Erendir pulls out the arrows and Bronwyn, who bleeds like a gutted pig and won't stop. Which really makes me wonder why it is that in this episode everyone is bleeding like the entire female ward of an asylum. Anyway, she dies! Yes! Finally, real consequences to actions. Then, to absolutely no one's surprise, she's alright. 
Fucking why? I can't have one thing? Whatever, Adar wants the sword, and as all hope seems lost and extra after extra is run through, giving a face that looks like they're only feeling mild discomfort from this sword in their gut, Adar is about to leave when over the horizon comes... Karen Sue. She and the Numenorean army have come to ruin the episode as they have made a beeline straight for Tirharad. How did they know where to go? I don't fucking know. I guess someone has a GPS. Now, Adar sees the shit about to hit the fan, so he decides to step to the side of the fan and gives Waldrag a task just before everyone's least favorite plank of wood, whose roots are growing out yet again, by the way, thanks makeup department, as she leads the Numenorians to dominate the orcs like they entered a contract with Christian Grey. The orcs who, once again, are not burning in direct sunlight. They even brought chains to clothesline the orcs who decidedly run TOWARDS the camera instead of AT the cavalry. Wait a fucking second, how would you know to bring this? What if you ran into a troll? You're fucked because he would grab the chain and whirl you around like a pair of nunchaku. Anyway, Adar decides to take the meaning of Iron Maiden's run to the hills to heart and flees, and Galadriel gives chase, but not before performing a move just as fucking stupid as Legolas swinging himself up onto the horse. Then not Sauron joins the pursuit. Galadriel is hot on Adar's tail, but can't quite catch up because she's exhausted all her carrots, until out of thin air, Halbrand appears ahead of them and trips Adar's horse, ending the chase. Then Halbrand and Adar have a moment where he almost skewers Adar and is stopped by Galadriel, so they bring him back to town to interrogate him. Back at Tir Harad, the Numenorians have mopped up the orcs, saved the people, and are celebrating like it's the first Thanksgiving. Bronwyn is now walking around like she wasn't just on Death's Door an hour ago, so I guess Boromir just wasn't man enough. Meanwhile, the walking 2x4 interrogates Adar, who claims he killed Sauron and is only trying to establish a home for his children, the orcs. He continues by calling Galadriel out on her bullshit, saying that she has darkness within her, and any argument that she makes is basically a pot calling the kettle black. And because she cannot stop one-upping herself, Galadriel states, to paraphrase, she will hunt every last orc to erase them from Arda, then save Adar for the last, when she will finally, to quote, stab him in his poisoned heart. Then, with a bit of role reversal, Halbrand prevents the genocidal maniac from killing Adar and leave him chained in the barn. Then these two take a walk outside and have a little sit-down, where they actually have a quote-unquote heart-to-heart moment where the writers actually are trying to convince us that these people have any amount of chemistry at all. Then in the town square, Bronwyn is introduced to Abercrombie by the Queen of Diversity Hires, and Halbrand is then acknowledged as the one true king of the Southlands because these writers heard you want more foreshadow in your foreshadow. Erendir mentions to Galadriel, to paraphrase, they've waited a long time for this. Then Cuntdriel over here smacks that line down with, quote, not nearly as long as the elves. Are, are you fucking kidding me? You can't let anyone have anything, can you? By Iluvatar, I hope someone high-fives you with a running lawnmower. At the same time, Erendir has a sit-down with his totally not son, Theo, who says that he feels the sword's influence. So, Erendir suggests that Theo be the one to hand off the sword as a way of conquering his addiction. After giving this suggestion, Erendir leaves, and Theo opens the sack and finds that to absolutely no one's shock, it isn't the Morgul Blade. Alright, hold the fuck up. You're gonna tell me that Erendir didn't open the sack to confirm it was the Morgul Blade? I'll give the walking 2x4 a pass on this one, because she didn't know what it was or what it looks like, but Erendir does. He knows it is a key, and absolutely cannot let it fall into the hands of the enemy, but didn't confirm it? Alright, that's a third strike, Erendir. Third strike! We'll come back to this later, as it is too late, Waldreg has snuck all the way back to Austeriath, activated the sword, put it in the ignition, and essentially... turns on Mount Doom. Yes, a one-off joke turned out to be more accurate than shooting fish in a barrel with a fucking railgun. Uh, Asteriath opens for some reason, and the water travels down the various canals the orcs have been digging all the way to Mount Doom through a gaping hole in the side of the volcano. The water mixes into the magma like Adar was trying to open a Guinness World Record nether portal, but instead, the nether came to Middle-earth as Mount Doom erupts like Yellowstone and practically terraforms most of the Southlands, consuming it all in a pyroclastic flow. A pyroclastic flow that Galadriel fucking tanks to the face like Thor did the Dwarf Star. Also, Adar managed to ninja his way out of there somehow. Great. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, and you listened through the recap, yes, this episode manages to almost entirely stay focused on something. Finally! You know, good job. We didn't go back to the third grade rewrite that was Game of Elves with Gilgalad manipulating Elrond like an on and off relationship, nor did we return to the pointless sadists wandering around the Rovarian. This episode stays almost entirely focused on the events in the Southlands, so good on the writers for finally doing something well enough through the entirety of an episode. Now let's go over how they fucked up the rest of it. Beginning with how absurd the tactical decisions are. To start, these orcs are marching their asses up this massive walkway that funnels them perfectly for a hail of Persian arrows. And considering these poor farmers who have probably never handled a bow in their lives have the aim of a Zeus dating commercial, I'm bewildered by why the defensible fortress was abandoned in favor of a village that has more points of attack than Poland. And why are the orcs walking with torches in the dark? They are creatures of the night! They are corrupted elves! They should see almost as well in the dark as the predator hunting seals in Canada. So excuse me if I'm confused as to why they would so willingly give up their position like George Washington crossing the Delaware while blasting America fuck yeah at a soothing thousand decibels. Not only this, but the villagers, many of whom are on top of the buildings, are only watching the one path instead of the surrounding area, so when you immediately notice Adar isn't in the fight, you know how bad things are about to go for the people. And of course, there's the plot armor. It is now definitive that unless your name appears in the top billing, you might as well be wearing a red shirt. We finally have an actual character get severely injured for once, which is a good thing. This show desperately needs to prove these characters aren't just going to get a pass like Bronwyn just because her shirt is as low cut as a French maid's outfit. What doesn't help is they tried to fake us out like the first time The Walking Dead pulled that shit with Glenn. Now the only way to make up for that is to course correct. And how about the volcanic eruption that turned half of the Southlands into Pompeii? I guarantee no one in the credits are dead. They will have survived inside the ruins of the keep, sorry, tavern, and they will unbury themselves, then lead some sort of exodus from the region while Galadriel the plot armored leads a hunting party in search of Adar and the remaining orcs. And for the sixth episode in a fucking row, goddamn Galadriel. I do not care what you say. Anyone who isn't a Super Saiyan should be fucking dead. With gases and volcanic material hitting you at upwards of 450 miles an hour and temperatures of 1500 degrees, Galadriel's ass should have been turned into Sarah Connor in her nightmare about Judgment Day. She got hit with the equivalent of cooking a chicken by slapping it and will brush that shit off like the Cheeto dust she's covered in at the beginning of the next episode. Also, I want to touch on how superfluous the so-called plan is here. So, presumably Sauron created this magical blood-drinking sword, right? This evil sword is not used for some ritualistic human sacrifice to bolster it and its wielder's power like a vampiric Frostmourne, no! It's meant to be stuck into a pedestal in the fort so it can open a dam that will allow the river to flow back into the valley below. By the way, you mean to tell me someone built Osteriath with more mechanisms than Castlevania's clock tower in the side of the fucking cliff instead of a simple lever that opens the floodgates? And the orcs have been digging these tunnels and canals from Mount Doom all the way towards the base the elves were posted at just so the water can flood down into the unpressurized volcano and blow it sky high? Alright, why the fuck did the Daedric artifact even need to be made in the first place when just about any other weapon could have done the same job or again, a lever. If this was the plan the entire time, then why weren't the canals already dug back when Sauron wasn't in hiding? Moreover, if the elves have the eyesight of the web telescope, then why the hell didn't they see the orcs from the tower in Osteriath? They should have spotted these trenches immediately like they were playing Where's Waldo in the Million Man March. How convenient elves can only see extremely well when the plot needs them to, because I distinctly remember when Legolas finally got the high ground and he was able to spot the orcs beyond the horizon saying, So how the fuck did none of the elves standing on top of this watchtower with a clear line of sight of this fucking valley and Mount Doom not see orcs digging trenches like it's World War II? Oh yeah, I'm using critical thought. That's not allowed in present day. You aren't allowed to question anything as much as you're not allowed to point out all the plot contrivances like how the orcs basically resupply themselves off screen after the collapse of Osteriath. Or how Bronwyn is struck with an arrow that probably punctured a lung as well as split an artery and though she should be dead like Elvis, she's totally fine. Let's not forget the expedition force just knows where to go and how to get there from wherever the fuck they landed to go through the Efel Duoth to gun straight for Tirharad and they already know it's under attack? 
And I'm not going to stop harping on this because Aaron Deer drops the ball at the finish line because he doesn't think to confirm that they have the Morgul Blade in their possession. Oh, but remember, folks, if you engage in the illicit questioning of the story, you're a hateful loser whose arguments aren't valid because you probably hated this show before it ever came out, says every Twitter bot in denial of reality. And they're the same people who think Galadriel is a good character. That she can do no wrong when she threatens the lives of Numenorean royalty, breaks the confidence of multiple volunteer soldiers, berates those who defy her, treats all those around her, even in their celebration, like this episode, with contempt, and let's not forget the threat of absolute genocide. My people, if anyone ever tells you this perversion of Galadriel is a good character, that should confirm said individual would have voted for Mao Zedong. And with so many people defending this show with such zeal, this confirms the culture around the art we make today has allowed the bar to fall so low that many genuinely see no difference between something legitimately great and objectively terrible. And I think that realization says a lot about the awful direction we continue to walk as a culture, as we're told, even demanded, to not think, just consume. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.